Okay, let's get underway. Hello again and welcome to the Reed Faculty Office Hours for the Departments of Chemistry and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. This faculty office hour is meant to be your time to ask questions of our two lovely professors who've made time to speak with you today. Um, and also to learn about what's special about learning in these majors at Reed, um, as well as in the minors and the other classes offered by the departments. We'll start with some introductions and all that good stuff, but I do wanna go over the chat instructions before we go any further. We are recording this session, so I've put you all on mute and I'm asking that you not come off of mute during the session. In fact, you probably don't have the capability to do so, so <laughs> good luck trying. Um, instead, if you can type out your questions and put them in the chat, I will feed them to the professors as we go um, to keep things all in working order. And if you're feeling shy for any reason, feel free to DM me your question so it can be anonymized, so to speak. And I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Maddie Reese. I'm a Reed alum, class of 2015, and I'm currently an assistant dean of admission here in the admission office. Um, I've only been doing that for about a year. Before that, I was living in France. So the extent of my experience with these departments is when I took intro chemistry <laughs> about 14 years ago, I was a French lit major. Um, but I love my experience in the chemistry department, and I'm excited to learn more about these departments today. Um, yeah, so with that, I think I'll have our faculty members introduce themselves. Today we have with us Kelly Chacon and Lynn Gratz. And Kelly, would you like to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kelly. I use they pronouns. I joined Reed in 2015. I grew up in the um, Oregon area, basically. I'm half Mexican with an immigrant dad, and I'm first gen. So it's pretty cool to be here at Reed to see all the different kinds of students we have here. And I fell in love with chemistry um, at like 25. <laughs> and so you basically, I think I would have loved a place like Reed because it had a little bit of everything because um, we're not just chemists, right? So yeah, um, I've had tenure since 2022, 20, I think. And I teach intro chem. Um, so the very first semester, which a lot, I think about a third of our students at Reed actually take chemistry, which is kind of cool. Um, and then I teach advanced biochemistry. So I teach the second semester of biochem, which is like homeostasis or like metabolism and a little bit of metals in biology. And then I also teach uh, the methods lab. So biochemical methods where you actually do hands-on real research where I don't even know the answer um, as juniors and seniors. And I'm also on the BMB committee, basically, for the college. So nice to meet you. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Off to you, Lynn. Hi. Um, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Lynn Gratz. I am an associate professor here in the chemistry department, and I also have a joint appointment with the Environmental Studies Committee. So if anyone here is also interested in environmental chemistry, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, I've been at Reed uh, just since August of 2023. So I did, this is my first year at Reed. I was a professor at Colorado College for eight years before that, though. So I've been in these um, small liberal arts college environments for a while now. Um, I come to chemistry from um, an initial training in atmospheric science. So my research is on air pollution and atmospheric composition, how pollution gets into the air, and then how it eventually makes its way into the ecosystem. Um, so I'm currently teaching in environmental chemistry. We were talking about nitrogen and sulfur cycling today. Um, I also teach um, analytical chemistry, um, the lecture and the lab component. I taught that in the fall. And then um, I teach a methods course for our environmental studies majors. So that has um, chemistry majors with an environmental studies emphasis and then other um, students from other majors across the college that also have an environmental studies emphasis. Um, so I kind of cross between the two Chemistry is my home um, department. That's where my lab is, and that's where my colleagues are that I see most days of the week. Um, I really enjoy working at undergraduate institutions. I love getting students involved in research early, sometimes being their first entry point to research. Um, I love sharing my research with them. I've got students in my lab next door right now working on some stuff for a field project this summer. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what kind of questions you all have about Reed and um, offer the best perspective that I have, uh, even though this is my first year at the college, but not my first year teaching wonderful young people like you. So thanks for being here. 
Wonderful. And thank you so much for being here, Lynn and Kelly. Um, without further ado, I'd love to hear more about um, the departments that you work in. And if you can speak a little bit to the requirements of majors in those departments, that would be great too. Sure. So I can speak to sort of the chemistry and BMB type stuff. And I bet Lynn would love to chime in with some of the environmental studies stuff. Um, so really there's the two main tracks. So if you want to do uh, chemistry, you essentially will do the first couple of years, get the fundamentals, take introductory chemistry, even if you have a lot of experience in chemistry. So that's something we often hear from students is I've already taken a lot of chemistry or I've done well in my AP or things like that. We teach it very differently than you might be used to learning it. It's extremely conceptual and actually goes a lot deeper, I think. Um, it seems simple, but it's a really different way of teaching. So um, we really just start with like <laughs> the atom and go from there. And so I think uh, students really end up enjoying this year of intro chem no matter what. And then you take organic chemistry with really involved labs, but both of these have really excellent labs that are designed by people who love to design labs. So it's not just sort of a cookie cutter thing. It's folks who really, really nerd out about finding new ways to teach you stuff that is fundamental. Um, and so after you get through those two and you're taking physics, things that are just sort of, because chemistry is a central science, right? So you're going to take a little bit of everything. If you're interested in it, you could take biology or some other sort of uh, science courses, but really the intro chem, the first year chem, and then the OCHEM are the two fundamentals. From there, you might decide to go straight into uh, chemistry with no biology or molecular biology or biochemistry type stuff. Uh, that means you would be taking physical chemistry, quantum chemistry, analytical chemistry, which is my favorite. Uh, folks don't think that biochemists use analytical chemistry, but it's pretty much every day. Um, and then we actually, after that, you have a few electives that you can take as a, a chemistry major in organic chemistry taught by Mir Bowering. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some other stuff. Oh yeah, there's also statistical thermodynamics, which really just like blows the lid off of what you thought you knew from first year chemistry and teaches you how really things work. Um, and then after that, there's of course your qualifying exam, which is really a rite of passage in your junior year where the courses that you've taken with us um, really come together in kind of a room with your professors and we ask you questions about a journal article. Um, most students now really love it. And then after you have passed your qualifying exam, you get to major and do a thesis in our department. And um, that can, you can work with pretty much any one you want in the chemistry department. It's all about interest and what you want to do um, generally with your life. You don't have to know exactly what it is you want to do. But the best part about read to me is that everyone's going to do a thesis. Everyone's going to get research experience, which is not always the case at every school. Um, and then, yeah, you end up doing a whole year of research one-on-one -on -one with a, with your professor. You make a thesis. You do kind of almost a defense of it at the end of the year. And so with BMB, which is Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, then you have the courses that are involving biology and biochemistry. So we are interdisciplinary, uh, which will, Lynn will have a lot to say about too with the ES program. So with BMB, you'll take the first year chemistry, second year organic chemistry. And then from there, you can take a lot of biology electives. So if you're really interested in microbiology or specifics of molecular biology, you wanna know more about plant physiology. Those are all things that you can take under the BMB umbrella. And then here in chemistry, you would be taking the biochemistry series one and two. One is about structure and function of proteins and enzymes. The second one would be more about metabolism and what it takes to kind of get out of bed in the morning energetically. Um, they also take statistical th thermodynamics, which is amazing because everything in nature has to do with thermodynamics. Um, you take a qualifying exam that is both biology and chem informed, and then you get to do your thesis with pretty much anyone who is under the BMB umbrella in either chemistry or biology. So there's a lot of, it's a little bit stricter in terms of when you take things because it's a four-year degree, but there's a lot of freedom in kind of what you want to study. So I can answer more specific questions. I know I went on for a minute, but just wanted to give you a sense of kind of where you go.
Right. Thank you, Kelly. That also helps clarify the difference between the two for me as an admission counselor. <laughs> Lynn, how about you? Yeah, I can um, add on a little bit in terms of what um, chem or environmental studies with a chemistry emphasis looks like. Um, and then to be totally honest, I had to pull up our major requirements website because this is my first year at Reed and I could probably recite an entirely different major to you that wouldn't be very meaningful right now. Um, and that's why I'm still learning and I'm really glad Kelly took the lead on what we do here in chemistry because I'm still getting myself even up to speed. Um, so essentially all environmental studies majors, whether they are in chemistry, biology, political science, history, or economics, they take a series of core courses. So everyone in environmental studies takes Chem 101 and 102, which is general chemistry. They also take Bio 101 and 102, and then another upper level um, course in math or natural sciences. So a lot of those students end up taking my environmental chemistry course because it you know, crosses into lots of different parts of the earth systems, but it's all, you know, chemistry focused. Um, all environmental studies majors also take um, an econ course, political science, they kind of sample from the different sort of flavors of environmental studies, if you will. And then they have a series of requirements in their home department. So for chemistry specifically, that looks like taking both semesters of organic. Um, it actually requires taking environmental chemistry with me as well as analytical chemistry. And then you have some choice of some of our other upper level courses, so depending on which kind of areas of chemistry are really speaking to you at that point. There's a number of courses that you could choose from to kind of fill out the chemistry side of your ES chemistry major. Um, and then you also take introductory physics, um, some math and um, an option between more math and computer science. So it kind of samples from a lot of the different sort of foundational disciplines that define environmental science and environmental chemistry while also um, crossing into the other disciplines that we really feel help shape that kind of interdisciplinary view of the environment and environmental problems. Um, I had students in all of my classes this year in the fall when I was teaching analytical and now when I'm teaching environmental chemistry who um, are environmental chemistry majors and I see them in and around the chemistry department a lot. So I think they have kind of a home base within chemistry, but then they also have these sort of touch points with students from other departments um, through that kind of umbrella of the of the ES program. Um, our uh, students also, you know, they do the same junior qualifying exam that Kelly just described for chemistry if you're an ES chemistry major. Um, the ES qualifying exam, if you will, happens through a course, which is our junior research seminar that you take in the spring of your junior year, which is a very applied kind of project-based course with all of the other juniors who are in environmental studies. Um, and then similarly, that allows you to then in your senior year um, work on an environmental chemistry or other version, um, depending on your major thesis, uh, very similar to majors across the college. So kind of a home base in chemistry and then that um, interdisciplinarity that students who choose ES, I think, are, are drawn to. We love interdisciplinary perspectives here at Reed. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. All right, I think a good next question would be to talk about um, what really sets these programs at Reed apart from comparable programs, maybe at different institutions and different types of institutions. Uh, many of our students here are not yet committed to Reed. And I think particularly in STEM, there's often a comparison with big, you know, powerhouse research universities. So what's different here? Lynn, I feel like you might have some insight to start with, and then I can fill it in. Sure, that's fair. Um, I mean, I went to a large state school myself um, for undergrad and also for graduate school. And I think one thing that I've really enjoyed about working at a, at liberal arts colleges is really that relationship, those relationships that I get to form with my students through small class sizes for um, kind of seeing them more regularly. I don't have, you know, TAs who are leading discussion sections and there's a lot of advantages to that. That's the model that I learned in as a, as a teacher. I really enjoy seeing that same group of students several times a week, really getting to build um, relationships with them inside the classroom, which, you know, then continues outside the classroom when they come to my office hours, when they want to talk to me about classes, when they want to talk to me about summer internships or planning for graduate school. Um, I just feel like I I, I know them in a different academic way than I did for with my professors um, when I was an undergrad myself until I got later in my major and then I was in smaller classes and got to know some of those professors. And I think that happens in my experience kind of from day one at a place like Reed where 
all of your courses that you're taking in your first year, you start to build those relationships right away. Um, so it really, I think fosters a really neat kind of tight knit um, community um, that I, that I really enjoy. And then I think what Reed also offers and um, again, comparing to my own experience as a student and working in another liberal arts environment is it really um, puts a lot of support behind uh, faculty research and getting students involved in faculty research. So um, I see a lot of students finding ways to get involved in research early, um, wanting to get that training outside of the classroom that sets them up well for when they do do their thesis. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues, I think, for students to explore the, you know, the reasons that they were drawn to the major that they've chose, the reasons that they were drawn to read, um, and getting to build those um, kind of faculty mentor relationships outside of the classroom as well. So part of what drew me to read was to be able to work in this environment where um, I got to think about my own research in a different way and have students involved in it um, all year long, if that's, you know, feasible to me, um, as well as in the summer, and then eventually working with students on their theses. So Yes. Yes to all of that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what's after being here now about 10 years, I also was the same as Lynn in that I went to sort of the traditional types of school. I went to community college first. Um, I was a transfer student um, and then I went to Portland State. And uh, if I had really known more about Reed, it would have been a perfect fit for me, I think. And um, when I came here, I think what drew me to read, because I was going to go and work at a, a bigger university, was the idea that you could really connect with students in a way that it wasn't like, it's not necessarily, there's always going to be that power imbalance, right? I'm always going to be the professor and you're going to be the student. And that's appropriate and good, I think. But there's also really this peer relationship that you have with your students that you don't get to have at a larger institution or maybe even at comparable institutions in the way that we do integrate science with our, our teaching. So for me, I take in students to do research in the summers that are as early as a rising sophomore. So right after they get in through intro chem, if they're a motivated, interested student, it's not about, they're not going to be able to necessarily start doing complex things right away, but there isn't that barrier or that hierarchy of like, oh, come to us when you're really ready or really serious. Um, a student could be thinking about chemistry, not really sure. And I would love to have them in the summer helping out, shadowing people, just learning what a lab is about. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, I think Reed is pretty special in that we do get really competitive grants and funding. We just got a brand new NMR. We got a huge grant for that. And it's like state of the art. And students as early again as like their sophomore year learning how to operate and use this amazing instrument. I currently have three active competitive grants uh, to do work. I, I hold my own when I go to my conferences and so does Lynn. Um, it's not like we're just playing around and I don't, that's not comparing to anybody else, but like we really are motivated as educators to do both. We don't just wanna do the research and get the grants. We want to build the next sort of generation of, of scientists. We teach you how to science and then you can go out and be scientists. Um, and I have a sense of pride and sort of responsibility. Um, we place a lot of people into really great grad programs or jobs. And I feel a sense of pride that they come out of my lab or our department really actually kind of at the level of maybe uh, finishing a first year of grad school in terms of research and being able to approach a problem. So it's accelerated, I think, but also really a safe place to be who you are. Reed is kind of a weird place. I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't say that we're not really hardworking. We're very hardworking, but you can be who you are within that and work how you want to. Um, I am not a traditional person, and I like that my students can be themselves and see that you can be a chemist or a scientist and be kind of wacky. I mean, we all really are, and I don't think you get to see that sometimes at larger places. I love that. Thank you for those answers. Um, I'd also love to hear about a favorite class. I know, Lynn, this is your first year at Reed, but... Um, can you give us that perspective inside the classroom? What's a favorite or special class you've been teaching? Um, 
I have three to choose from so far. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm really enjoying teaching environmental chemistry right now, I have to say. Um, I think what I'm getting to teach in that class and the things that I'm introducing to my students is um, really allows me to tap into what drew me to what I do now and what I study. Um, so I um, like I went through an engineering program as a student. I worked with faculty in public health and geochemistry and chemistry and atmospheric science. And I felt like I always kind of had my foot in, in multiple different places. And, and this is why, like, this is what I got really excited about at some point. And um, environmental chemistry has been a fun class and that it is, um, it fits into the environmental studies curriculum. And at the same time, I also get to choose kind of what things we spend time on and also see what the students are excited about. There's a lot of flexibility in it in the sense that there isn't a class that necessarily follows it. So I get a, a lot of um, space to play. And I also am giving the students a lot of chance to, um, through some of the different activities and assignments that I built into the course, um, a chance to dig deeper into some topics within environmental chemistry that they've gotten really excited about or came into the room really excited about, but maybe it's not something that we got to spend, you know, a big chunk of time on in the course. So I built in opportunities, again, because students in the classroom are from the chemistry department, but they're also from biology and I have some from political science and they're in the room with a lot of different perspectives. So I have a lot of fun giving them that freedom to um, go a little deeper into something um, that maybe drew them to the course or to their major um, in the first place. Hmm. Uh, I can't choose. Um, I love for different reasons, right? So um, I think what's cool for me is that I teach, you know, a, a sort of the entry level and then also at the more advanced level. And most of us do. Right. Um, but I love intro chem or college chemistry, whatever you want to call it, because, again, I end up meeting everybody the very first semester. Um, but they're not all first years. So I do get a good cohort of people that are just starting at Reed uh, that maybe are thinking about being some kind of a STEM major. But then I also get tons of sophomores, juniors, and seniors that really want to take chemistry with us. Um, we're really proud of the department that we've created where anyone can come and become an informed citizen or learn more about kind of a pet project or idea that they have. Um, and the way that we teach the course is such that you really can, after one year of taking this course, you know, read read an article online and really be able to parse that out and, and think critically um, and know the difference between, you know, what a theory is versus a law versus a hypothesis and not in a dry way, but really in that really evolving way. Uh, of understanding your world. So I love that. I love to see the transformation in both our first years and our juniors, senior sophomores who are just interested in chemistry for the sake of it. Um, and then the other, like my advanced courses, I guess my, my favorite parts of each of those are, um, so for homeostasis, which is kind of the chemistry of life, really, like getting into the nitty gritty, the molecules that actually do the stuff, how we you know, reverse entropy every second to to stay alive. And it kind of delves into nutrition in a way that, again, it helps to create informed citizens like these certain supplements. Like, let's talk about chemically why some of those could work or don't work. Or what would you invent for a supplement, knowing what you know now about how the organism works? So I think that's really cool. Um, and students are getting more comfortable with reading primary literature, like really delving in and learning how to understand what could be seen as dense and really helping them learn how to translate that. Um, and then I guess my very favoritist is my biochemical methods lab because it's a course-based undergraduate research experience, meaning that I select essentially something I'm kind of interested in. This year, it's something called rustocyanin, which is a protein that is bound with copper ions and it eats iron as its main, like that's its main job is to turn iron into rust essentially. It is a beautiful blue green color and there's just so much cool stuff you can do when you shoot light at it. Um, so students can learn how to grow, you know, the protein in E. coli, so a little bit of sort of molecular biology there, uh, and then learn how to chemically separate the protein, which is really, it's, it's a chemical thing, but people are like biochemistry, what is that? 
So you learn how to separate the protein from the cell components, and then you end up with this beautiful blue protein. I have students this year that are doing electron paramagnetic resonance, isothermal calorimetry, cyclic voltammetry. I know these are all just like words, but still like the idea that you can do those things and that we really don't know what the answers are going to be or if it's going to work. It is so fun. And I make the students literally find many of the protocols or come up with their own ways to do things because that's what the real world is like is, you know, you get into a job or you go to grad school and you have to kind of read and educate yourself of like, oh, hey, is this new project? How do I approach this? There's no lab manual anymore. And so it's really fun to see that transformation of like a little bit of panic and chaos. And now the students are like, okay, I'm going to go in the lab and do this thing. And I'm like, yes, it's working. Independence. I love it. So yeah, there's things I love about all of them. That's so cool. And that's validating for me because I go out around the country and tell people about Reed and I say, yeah, it's really academically rigorous, but somehow it's also really playful. People are always playing around. And I feel like you just explained exactly that. <laughs> um, I'd love for you both to speak a little bit more to, we are, we touched on it a little bit, but the specificities of studying um, chemistry or bio biochemistry and molecular biology um, in a liberal arts context. I remember as an incoming Reed student, um, I signed up for intro chemistry and I was like, what are we going to do in a conference? Why are we having a round table about science? Um, I can start. <laughs> um, I think... Um... I think really getting into um, the applications of what we're doing in the classroom and really taking the time, like Kelly said, to, you know, to sit down and read papers and to talk about some of the broader connections that might not necessarily be chemistry, right? What are the societal connections? What is the what is the history behind the discipline or behind, you know, why this particular thing is something that someone decided we should study, you know, how do we ask the questions that we ask and why do we ask them and who do they affect? Um, I enjoy that. Those are the things that we can bring into the classroom. Um, and as part of the reason that people are here, um, it's a lot less of, you know, sitting and sort of just taking notes out of the textbook and kind of following, um, you know, these sort of disciplinary silos. And there's certainly a time and a place when we do that too. But I think um, having the flexibility and and the encouragement to sort of think outside of that in terms of, you know, why we study what we study and um, what brought us here as scientists and the ways in which what we study connects to the outside world. I think, again, that's a lot of what draws me to environmental chemistry specifically, but I think the liberal arts environment really fosters that. Okay. What was the question? <laughs> like I had it and I was like, wait, no, that's why I paused. I was like, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I framed it two different ways. What's special about teaching and studying science at, at a liberal arts school? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then like, what do you do in chemistry conference? <laughs> oh, okay. Great. I like all of this. Okay. So, um, I don't know how to answer the first one because it's like, I'm kind of entrenched in it. But like, again, I think I, I sort of answered, I think we did kind of answer this earlier. Like for me, it's really about the fact that I can show what it is to be a human doing science rather than sort of being this uh, figure in people's lives. Um, I, I like that undergrads don't necessarily know if I'm a big deal or not at the beginning. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's not about that cult of personality. It's about me being there as just a person showing you that you can, you can do this too. Um, and then conference is really cool. So I didn't talk about this. So the structure of how introductory chemistry works. Um, and I don't like to say introductory. I like to say college chemistry because it is kind of like, it's not like the first time some people have seen chemistry. It really is the first time that you're learning how to do college chemistry for many folks, not if you're a transfer or something like that. Totally. We, we cover the same things, but yeah, anyway. So how we do it is that we have a larger group of students. It's still not large, large, like 
um, you think about universities, it's like sometimes a thousand people <laughs> in a room, right? Um, and then conversely, there's places where it's super, super small and kind of like, you don't really want to speak. Uh, it's like kind of awkward. So we're kind of in the middle We have about 40 students in my particular section. Most of us have about 40 to 50 in our section. We've had a lot of enrollment. Uh, we've been really lucky to have that again, because we try to have a really inclusive department. Um, so you go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you get the Kelly show, right? So you kind of get the, the Ted talk for the stuff that, um, you're reading and that you're thinking about in lab. Um, we do interactive stuff. I use a lot of sort of on the fly, not necessarily clickers, but like, which is just a way to immediately sort of text in what you think, but it's really nice because I can kind of gauge where the class is and be like, okay, I think we need to go over this again. Or man, you guys are really getting this. Let's, let's keep going. Um, and I am a goofball, so I really enjoy getting to do that. Um, and so then, so you have your three days a week of like lecture ish. And I particularly, because I am sort of a, a showman, um, I do sort of do lecture, but it's very interactive. Every single one of our professors gets to teach exactly the way that they want. That's a really, I think that is a key difference to some places where you're handed a curriculum and like, this is how we teach it. We have the overarching theory of how we do things, which is conceptual, very conceptual. But within that, um, you know, not everybody is the same as me. And so like my colleague Mir uh, really flips the classroom and really has students guiding the entire lecture. It's actually kind of magical to watch. I've seen Mir's lecture notes and it's like one page with like three sentences on it, right? And so you're in there and it's just like really magical to watch how they guide a class. Um, and then other folks will do like actual worksheet, like actually activities together or different things. Nicole J James is amazing. Um, she essentially studies how people learn chemistry. Uh, and so she's always almost kind of experimenting on the class and the class is completely complicit in this. They know what's going on. She's very high on the metacognition of all of this. So it's like this really interesting thing where the students know that they're sort of the guinea pigs. Uh, Nicole is sort of the guinea pig and they're learning things in totally different ways. And we've also really, um, I don't know if folks, I think folks kind of know about our grading, sort of not grading, uh, and in STEM, that might seem really uncomfortable, but the way that we tend to do things, at least in the first year, is sort of by specification. So um, you have an opportunity throughout the semester, if you didn't do great on, like say it wasn't, like it took a while for you to get this one concept. Like as long as you're doing satisfactory, you're doing satisfactory, like you're fine. You have shown that you have competency in that particular subject. If for some reason you really were faltering on that subject, you can demonstrate the knowledge of that sus uh, that subject any time in the semester. So essentially it takes away that stress of like, I didn't get this, I don't know what's going on, and now I don't understand the rest. We've taken that away because that's not really how learning works. So anyway, you have this lecture of whatever form it may be, then you have your practical, which is the lab. So lab meets once a week. It's um, a three hour class. We're always kind of changing things, but it is always for real. You're doing real stuff. Um, sometimes like some years we've built spectrophotometers. Other times we're like quantifying the amount of phosphorus in, you know, the canyon water. There's all kinds of different things that we do. And then in the second semester, students actually come up with their own project and they will be presenting their scientific posters actually next week, I believe, which is super cool. So then you have your lab and that's the entire semester. Um, and we teach you a little bit, a little bit of coding in there most years. So we use something called R. Um, but we'll also use Excel and things like that to do different ways of looking at data. You got it. You got to learn how to crunch data. And so then conference, you might know about Hume conference, and that is in some ways kind of the same, but not. It's a way that we can have you in small groups. So it'll be like 10 students, 10 to 12 students in each of these sections. I teach like three or four sections of it. So that's where I get to know everybody really well. Um, and we, at least in my conference, we'll do like maybe a little mini experiments, like we'll look at the emission spectra of various excited gases and answer questions. 
Um, we have a lot of group work, but in a way where, because not everybody loves group work. So we talk about actually, you're going to be professionals in the world. And I'm going to pretend that you're scientists. How do we actually work in groups to get shit done? And I'm going to swear because it's true. Like you got to get shit done sometimes. Um, and so we have this hour once a week where it really is about making sure that you understand things, translating them in another way. Students get to know each other and become their own little cohort. You find your study buddies that way. And I really get to know each of you one on one, which is one of my favorite things. So I finally answered about conference, but it took me a while. Perfect. No, thank you. That was very illuminating. All right, I feel like I've asked enough questions. So I'm gonna start pulling some from the chat. A few have rolled in. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take this complicated <laughs> chemistry one first about hydroxyethyl cellulose. Someone asks, I can't get my HEC to gel. Oh, <laughs> that person is even holding a bottle up to the screen. Um, is there anyone in the department who would be willing to answer random questions? Or maybe do you have a, tri a tip for getting HEC to gel? <laughs> You'll have to come to read to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. <laughs> uh, the short answer is, I mean, we'd have to talk about it more. I'm sure you know this, Molly. But um, totally. I mean, we could definitely set up a time to talk. Um, I don't know if I know the exact answer or what you want to do it for, but I think it's cool that you want to, to like mess with lipids, surfactants, colloid science. I can say that Nicole James is doing a bunch of stuff, looking at materials. Um, Gonzalo Campillo Alvarado is our material, like he's, um, he's an organic chemistry professor and he actually makes these liquid crystals and knows a lot about sort of the nature of things like he probably would know a lot about colloid science um, and he does a lot of x-ray sort of diffraction work too which is pretty neat um, and I actually I didn't really talk about my own research but um, I'm a bioinorganic chemist so I look at the intersection between proteins and the metals that do all the cool work because they're pretty colors and I like that. Um, and I'm an x-ray absorption spectroscopist in addition to other spectroscopy. So I use really high powered x-rays. I take students with me to the synchrotron at Stanford and we actually shoot x-rays at these metal um, loaded proteins and learn more about our world. So I also now I'm studying membrane proteins, which deal a lot with lipids. So definitely trying to make the protein happy uh, that wants to be in a greasy sort of environment. How do we get it out of the cell, take it away from the stuff that we don't want and now put it into the right kind of fats? Uh, this is something that we're really interested in. So I would love to answer your questions. You are welcome to email me. Uh, Maddie can give you my email. I won't always know the answers, but for sure, if you come to read, we will be super excited about talking with you about this. And just while I'm here, the Chem 221, 223 at PCC, go PCC. Um, that covers essentially the entire year of chemistry at a college level. You are one of the rare unicorns that could talk to us about starting right in um, and taking some other courses. Uh, so hopefully that helps you. So you could probably start in organic or whatever else you might want to start in. That's good to know. Thanks, Kelly. Could you, I know you mentioned it at the beginning, but could you just repeat for the group um, what the kind of approach towards transfer credit and previous experience in chemistry is? We get yes. this a lot. <laughs> yes. So again, I want to, I want to help people understand that what we teach is college chemistry. So essentially what Molly has taken or is taking is college chemistry. So like after high school, you are now a college student, and that is a very specific beginning of your next chapter of chemistry. So many students ask, oh, I've had, I have a high score on AP chemistry. Can I just skip uh, introductory chemistry at Reed and just start right in with the next thing? And the answer is no, because we're going to blow your mind. Um, what you think you know about introductory chemistry uh, is not, it, we're going to start like, it, first it's going to be like, oh, this is review for about two weeks. And then we're going to start going into thinking about um, the atom in ways that you really haven't before. Um, you probably do know about our student run nuclear reactor. We really, I get very excited. We teach a lot about nuclear chemistry. So that's something that a lot of students may not have covered. And yes, I go as far as the quarks. Um, and so, oh, I don't know why 
Hi. Yeah. I love it. Um, <laughs> so you do need to take, we make all the students who want to take or be chem majors or BMB majors, um, take introductory chemistry with us. If you have, if you're from a different country and you, you're not sure, um, if you took college courses when you were in high school, um, uh, talk to us, we're not here to like shut you out or to say that you are not ready if you actually are ready. But that said, it's very, very rare that a student who thought, oh, I think I'm ready to just skip forward. It's very rare that at the end of the year, they say, no, I should have skipped it. They generally are like, this was, we quickly left known territory. And I now think about chemistry a very new way, thanks to that first year. Thank you. I did want to circle back before I forget. Um, it seems like you spoke to most of your colleagues' research interests there, Kelly, but um, Lynn, would you be able to just review what your area of specialization is and your colleagues? Yeah, so my work is in atmospheric chemistry. Um, I do a lot of work mostly on mercury in the environment and specifically in the atmosphere, mercury uh, chemistry, where mercury comes from. Um, my most recent project was looking at um, mercury redox chemistry in the atmosphere and trying to better understand that. Um, and then I do a lot of work on ozone in the environment as well. So ozone in polluted urban environments and then ozone and other pollutants that come out of um, wildfires. So uh, the longer I have spent time in the Western part of the country, which is not where I am originally from, I've um, become increasingly interested in studying the kind of composition and chemistry of uh, biomass burning plumes. So most of my research happens in the outdoors and in the air, but I've also, um, collaborated on and supported student projects measuring uh, mercury and other heavy metals in other parts of the ecosystem. So um, at my previous institution, I had a student uh, measuring mercury and other metals in um, songbird feathers. And so we were looking at um, kind of thinking about um, kind of different exposure pathways and where we expected to find higher levels of pollutants in um, a particular kind of industrialized area. I've measured mercury um, and other nutrients like carbon and nitrogen in soils. Um, so I have the capacity to expand to other parts of the earth system besides just the air, but that's kind of where my main research happens. Great, thank you. All right, let's move this along. We have about 15 minutes left, so I wanna try to get to all the questions in the chat. Um, this one should be pretty easy. When can or should an incoming student sign up for classes? I mean, during orientation week, right? I mean, I think that's the best part. Um, and actually that brings up something very interesting, which is that at Reed, we are your advisors. So like, instead of going to like, uh, you know, an office somewhere on campus, although of course we do have such offices that can help you, um, you actually are assigned a professor who will be your advisor through um, your four years here. If you change majors or you don't quite vibe with your particular advisor, you can switch any time. No one's hurt. Um, but yeah, when you come in, in your first year at Reed, you'll have orientation, you'll get to know everything. You'll kind of have your little cohorts and then it's time to actually enroll in your classes. And so we will have advising day where you come in and I've basically read all of you. Like if you were my advisee, I would have read your letter to me um, your information about where you're kind of from, you know, basic, basic data about who you are. And, um, it's really cool. You get to know that it's not just kind of a person in an office, but a person who is in the field that maybe you're interested in pursuing and what you say in that room. Thank you, Siri. Um, <laughs> what you say in that room is really between me and you. I'm not your parent. I'm not your therapist. Um, but I can help you navigate sort of what it is to be at college and how to work with your first year and get all of your courses figured out. Um, and you can kind of change anytime you want, but yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. That first week is really exciting getting to meet all of you. And then I check in with you at four weeks, eight weeks, whenever you want weeks, um, and can help you with all kinds of different stuff. Great. So it looks like some of our other questions are about um, specific pathways. Um, one student has asked if I'm interested in 
uh, plant science, what would be sort of the best path for me at Reed? Oh, great question. So Lynn, do you have anything about plants you'd like to mention? I would direct you to the biology department. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with your bio. Um, and then within biology, there's um, certainly the environmental studies with a biology concentration, um, which will again have biology as kind of like the home base departmental core with the kind of interdisciplinary nature to it. But otherwise, um, Kelly, you probably know some of the faculty over there better than I do, but I do know um, several of the people who do um, more of the kind of ecology side of things. And we have several great faculty members over there. Um, and that I think would be the place to be. Yeah, um, right now, in fact, we have Aron Ramirez in bio who is outside of our loading dock, um, burning pieces of wood <laughs> to learn more about what these plants are giving off and studying more about them. Um, then we also have Keith Carolee who does plant genetics. Um, if you were interested in plants sort of like, this feels BMB or, biology depend or or actually ES bio depending on what you're really interested in and the fact is you don't need to know exactly yet you know super focus in um what you can do is sort of explore all of those in your first couple of years until your sophomore year when you really like declare your major so as long as you're getting that essential science like taking some bio classes taking a few chem classes taking those fundamentals from there you can start to figure out what you're most interested in. And then maybe you wanna go into straight up um, biology and learn more about plant biology. Maybe you wanna look at special compounds in a plant. Okay, maybe that's more of a BMB side of thing. Or maybe you're interested in looking at the release of plant terpenes and its relationship to our atmosphere. That would take you into more of the environmental side, whether that's environmental bio or environmental chem chemistry, it really just depends on the question. So we kind of have a fit for all of that. And honestly, as your, your not advisor yet, I would say keep your mind open because we probably have something that you hadn't really thought of in that realm. Just to briefly follow up on that, I was talking to a student yesterday who is a first year who's in one of my classes right now, and they're sort of feeling torn between being, say, a chemistry major, sort of your chemistry, I I don't know what we call it, but sure. just chemistry yeah. or um, <laughs> just chemistry or environmental <laughs> studies chemistry. And so we were, you know, registration for classes is happening next week for currently enrolled students. And so we were sort of strategizing ways in which to register for classes, even in their sophomore year, that would kind of keep both pathways open, which is challenging. There's a lot of courses you kind of have to take them at the right time. And um, there's only like not always a ton of wiggle room, but there's enough overlap between say chemistry and ES chemistry. And I don't know the bio majors as well, but would imagine at least in your first year and maybe even into the second year, there's still some ways to be strategic and sort of take courses that you could really still pivot one way or the other once you really feel like you have a sense of what's, um, you know, really exciting you and kind of um, speaking to you and calling in a particular direction. Yeah, and your thesis too, like it sometimes takes students up until their thesis when they kind of figure out what specific thing they want to look at. And really, we're not going to like gatekeep you from a certain lab that really won't, could could offer that to you. So even if you're like, oh, I'm in completely just in the bio program and I love bio, but I just realized I really want to be able to use uh, liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy to look at these compounds. Cool. You can work with uh, somebody in the chemistry department or in ES to really like figure that out. So I think if you're interested, we try to find a way to get you to it. And sometimes that means also um, helping you to find research opportunities, perhaps in the summer, if we're taking students in the summer, or to help you get an REU or an internship somewhere that will give you that sort of niche information. Right. I want to piggyback off of what you were just saying to ask if you could give us an overview of uh, the first year schedule for someone who's interested in BMB. Yeah, first year schedule is going to be pretty simple. You're going to take uh, math if you need to, um, generally. So we assume, and like if you need a brush up, we can help with that too. But assume that you're going to take a math course of some kind. You're going to take introductory chemistry or college chemistry. Um, and then you're going to take likely biology, biology 101. Um, and then you may 
you're going to take Hume. So that's going to be really nice for a little, a little respite. Um, Hume is really cool. I wish I could have taken something like Hume. And I have to say this, after a year of Hume, you all become really good writers. I have never seen anything like it. Um, I do not have to worry when I see a lab report that it's going to be like going after the little things. Um, I'm just going to try to help you find your voice. And so it's really nice. And I think Hume, while um, some people are like, I just want to do science. I think that you're all at read or coming to read for this sort of well-rounded thing. And it can be really nice to have that at the same time you're doing all these hardcore, hardcore courses. And then you're going to do physics in the following year, most likely. Some students will do all three at once. Uh, and that's the gamut. But uh, we generally advise a three unit start. So essentially Hume, bio and chem probably that first year with maybe a math class thrown in. Thank you. And then back to specific paths that students are interested in. We got a similar question about biotechnology. How could one pursue that interest at Reed? Well, I had a thesis student, Gavin Dury, who graduated was really like, so they took my um, metabolism class, right? And they had like, didn't realize that there you can mess with an organism's pathways, right? To get to certain things or optimize conditions to make some kind of a protein that can be used in, in technology or in industrial applications or something, or like using algae to produce energy, you know, all this really wild stuff. I don't do that stuff. Um, but again, you're going to go out into the world and find a more specific place to do exactly the exact thing you want to do. What I can do or what your thesis advisor and your professors can do is to say, okay, these are the tools that you're going to need in that trade. You're going to need analytical chemistry. You're going to need to know more about organic chemistry. You probably should take this biology course um, in applications of molecular biology. And then, of course, when you do thesis, what I did with Gavin um, who now is like working at like a really incredible startup in San Francisco doing exactly what they want to do in biotechnology. Um, and it was really cool because they didn't necessarily work on that in my lab, but what they did do was optimize cell cultures and mess around with them to see if they could get better yield of my particular membrane protein, which is an E. coli. So there were ways that we just made sure, and then they wanted to kind of look at big data. So we hooked up with Anna Ritz in the computer science uh, and biology department to look at how we could see bigger networks for this. And figure out the next way to go. So biotechnology, we don't have a specific program. That seems to me like a thing where we would teach you a lot of the fundamentals that you would need. You'd take the electives that were in somewhat your interest. You'd think very carefully about thesis and what skills you want rather than necessarily the person that you're imprinted on working with. And we would definitely get you into one of the many REU programs or help you to get research experience before you graduate to see if it's for you, right? Because that's really the thing is we think we want to do one thing and then we end up going, oh my God, I really, really got excited about this other thing. So giving you that exposure is what we're all about. Oh, and study abroad. I don't want to forget about that. So just because you're in STEM, um, doesn't mean, and don't listen to anybody. Um, if you want to do study abroad and you want to take organic chemistry, uh, in Italy, let us know, we can help you. You can do a one semester or a full year. Again, as a person who's first gen, I had no idea that that was available to me. Um, it is available to you. It is covered. You will do it under the school's help and people can do it in STEM. And they, I have a student right now, an advisee that's going to the Netherlands, for a semester and is going to take quantum and all these really great chemistry courses and come back. It's not a problem. You just have to let us know right away so we can plan it out. Awesome. All right. We're running out of time, but there are two big questions I want to get to. Um, one is from an interdisciplinary inclined person who asks if it's possible to major in ES and BMB together, two interdisciplinary majors combined. <laughs> wow. Oh. So you exist. Here's what you could do. <laughs> you would want to with the electives that you could take, which there are one or two, you could take so you could take environmental, you definitely could take ES, an ES course or two. Um, you would definitely talk to 
I mean, frankly, like Lynn and I about opportunities of like, maybe there's a collaboration that she and I have never thought of, right? Um, and thinking about ways that rather than like trying to like wear all of the hats, which doesn't always work, but rather to focus on again, this we we can really help you to steal the skill set that you're hoping to get. And we can help, we have a lot of connections in the world. So we can also help you to find opportunities to talk with people about what kind of thing you wanna do. Generally with the two interdisciplinary, the way that interdisciplinary is, there's so many courses that you have to take because it's already interdisciplinary that we really just wanna make sure that you're getting the courses that interest you and that your thesis and that your research opportunities reflect what it is you want to do. So if you wanted to kind of bring those two together and people do all the time, we'd probably be like, okay, you need to take analytical and you should probably take some ES. And then we'll think carefully about your bio electives and what you want to do there and get you that background in chemistry. So I wouldn't fret. Plus you don't really want to qualify in both of those, do you? You have to take two qualifying exams. It's a lot. And I'll just add that there are five environmental studies majors, and that's pretty explicit, but um, so environmental studies, chemistry, environmental studies, biology, um, political science, history, and econ. So those are your five choices when it comes to environmental studies, but just building off of what Kelly just said, if someone was an environmental studies major uh, with a chemistry emphasis or environmental studies with a biology emphasis, I think through either of those paths, depending on like which sort of core foundation you wanted, you could build in your electives, you could get involved in research, you could plan for your thesis to really tap into more of the like BMB things that are attractive to you, even if one of those two ES majors was um, kind of your, your curriculum, I guess. Um, so I think there are creative ways to do it, especially if you know early that you want to, you know, mix and match and find ways to, to build around that. Makes sense. I see those last two questions, Maddie. I could probably knock them out if you want. I think uh, since we are really up to the hour, I really just would like you to focus on research opportunities. And that kind of addresses all the questions that are left, including uh, student access to different equipment. Totally. Okay. Research opportunities, many. That's something that we really, really uh, prioritize. A student will have access to be able to learn and be trained appropriately uh, to run uh, these things. Some students can learn to run them on their own if they really spend a lot of time. So I have students that can use HPLC, um, the ICP OES, the mass spec. I mean, this is part of what we do is that you really are getting to use them, not just submitting a sample. You really will run the NMR or help to run it. Um, and then the reactor, of course, you're actually keeping it going, which is pretty cool if you're part of that program. Um, and then, yeah, research is really a big thing. We need it. So we are all generally funded, like, frankly, relevant scientists in the world. And we're very proud of that. And that's part of why we're at Reed is to be supported in that way. So we need your help. We're going to train you how to do it. Uh, we know how to train you. And then you have good hands to help us do cutting edge science and be on publications. Like, it's pretty cool. So do you hire students over the summer typically? Yeah. So we generally have a certain number of like spots for students. We prioritize how much experience you've had, what year you're in. So we try to make sure that everyone uh, who's super interested, who's a major will get some kind of opportunity. Um, some students, for example, in BMB will go work up at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, which is like the premier teaching and research hospital uh, one of the best in the United States. So you can go and work on really wild stuff. Talk about biotechnology. You could probably go do biophysics, all kinds of stuff like that. And we can help with that. Um, and then, yeah, so in the summer, we generally have room for about 14 to 20 students, unless some of us have additional grants. So I ended up taking additional students. Um, and then there's also opportunities for people who have just graduated that, that three months when you've just graduated and you're like, well, I don't have the next thing lined up you are skilled. We'd love to keep you in the lab if we have money for it. So it just kind of depends. But we we are on a contract. We work for nine months out of the year with teachers, right? And so that three months in the summer, it really is that time when we um, get to really just lead our research program. So you really get to see kind of what that's about. And we have an application of process that is really open to everybody. We just want interest. Really, it's not about, you know, are you super great at this? It's like, come in and see what it's about and we'll train you. Awesome. 
Thank you so much. And thank both of you for all of these wonderful, detailed, thorough answers to all the questions. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to take questions because it seems like people had a lot they wanted to know, but I'm really glad all of you were able to make it today and hear from some real life read professors who are excited to possibly teach you next year or in the future. Um, with that, we are going to wrap up. I just have a couple announcements for everybody here. Um, Reed loves to offer these virtual programs. We know that not everyone can visit campus, and we really want to open the door so that you can see what the learning environment is like here, what Readies are all about. Um, so please keep an eye on our website for more virtual events like this. I think the most exciting one happening this week is an academic panel um, featuring Kathy Olson, who's the Dean of the Faculty, and Nigel Nicholson, who's former Dean of the Faculty and both longtime Reed professors. So this is another opportunity if you feel like you have more questions, you can get those answered tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the academic panel we're hosting. I just put a link to our on-campus visits as well. I meant to make that a virtual events link. <laughs> <laughs> So let's get that one. And you can see all of our virtual events at that link. And then if you do want to come to campus, I strongly, strongly encourage it, especially if you're an admitted student, you have the limited time opportunity to come to a read admit day, you get to spend a half day on campus, hang out with current students, attend a student faculty panel where you hear in person about the working relationship between read students and their professors. Um, and then you also get to do fun stuff, go on tours of the reactor. We offer those for admitted students um, a few times a year and yeah, get to see the campus in spring, which is the most beautiful time of the year here in Portland, in my opinion. <laughs> if you're not an admitted student, there's also um, campus visits available pretty much any day of the week and Saturdays. So I highly recommend making the trip over. And when you're a 12th grader, you can stay overnight in the residence halls and visit a class. So maybe you could sit in on one of Kelly or Lynn's classes for real. <laughs> all right, I'm done with my spiel. <laughs> And thank you all so much for being here. If you need anything, please reach out to admission at read.edu. And you can also write to current students at writeaready at read.edu. Thank you all for your time and have a lovely evening. See you soon. Bye.